Hi everyone, really excited to see you today. I've got a really good video coming up on building a storage solution to try and help organize my insanely untidy workshop. Let's get going. Saturdays we have a problem to solve we need to put some storage in place for this mess here the existing storage I've got for drill bits is too small as you can see and it doesn't really cater for any different types of drill bits so what I end up doing is just piling everything on here because I'm normally in too much of a hurry the other problem with this is that it's too far away from the drill press so we're going to make something to put everything in and keep everything nice and tidy we're going to build a storage solution that goes here. In, it's going to be fairly straightforward to do, hopefully. It's not going to take a massive amount of wood because I don't have that much space for it anyway. And how many drill bits do you need, right? To help make the storage unit more organised and more flexible, we're going to do some flexible solutions for inside of the cabinet. So stay with the video and you shall see all the magic at the end, hopefully. Unless I really mess it up, in which case you might never see this video. This is going to need to move. So I'm going to take this off. We're going to stick it down here somewhere. As you can see, the nuts and bolts box that I've got actually is on a French cleat bracket. Now, if you don't know what these are, they're amazing and this will change your whole life. Not probably quite that much, but you know, a little bit. All they are is a 45 degree angle piece. If you can see that, you basically have two opposing 45 degree cuts. Gravity pulls them down and you get a nice tight join between the two without actually having to screw anything together, which is very useful for a workshop because then it means you can move stuff around exactly like we're needing to do right now. Where do I put it? I have no idea. That'll do for now, right? So this basically is our available space, which isn't too bad, actually. I didn't want to go too big. I've got reasonably limited timber. I really don't want to have to go and buy some more because that involves going to a very large orange big box store, which is just carnage on a Saturday. So the first thing we need to do is decide how big we're going to actually need it. Now, I'm not going to do that by measuring this space. What I'm going to do is I'm going to organize the drill bits on the on the bench to see if I can get a rough idea of size and shape. Don't worry, I'm not going to subject you to that. I'll do a very fast time lapse and hopefully that won't be too painful. <laughs> So I need to just organise these roughly, I think, into what sort of shape I might need them to be in when I've got them in a cabinet. marked out on with tape roughly where I think the edges might go. It just helps visualize exactly what you're trying to achieve. So these would be the doors because they're going to go and fold in like that and then this will be the main part of the back. Now I should have enough wood doing looking at that over there. If you don't have it all in the right place you can never find anything and it makes jobs that you're doing twice as hard. You spend more time looking for your tools than you end up doing the thing that you came out to do in the first place which is quite a lot of my life 
Frosner bits are kind of annoying because they take up so much space. And they've also got different size shank pieces on the bottom, which is kind of annoying as well. You may be wondering what that is. You can see that. That is a special drill bit to do pocket holes. It goes through a jig and then, oh, that's a good idea. We could put the jig in there as well. All drilling paraphernalia in the same place. You have your piece of wood like that. And this goes in here and drills the bottom. And this piece is to pre-drill the actual hole the screw is supposed to go into. And this bit dr drills the pocket hole. And this is just a stop on the shank. So you can then do a variable depth because you may only have a thin piece of wood. A bit of time spent planning and that can save a whole load of time later. And I wonder whether that should go there because these are kind of like special things. What we're gonna do though, is we're gonna make some rails to put all these things in. Similar to this one, as you can see, it's got a French cleat on the back. This is a bit, this is far too big. But the idea with this is that we'll be able to move these pieces around after we put them in so we can rearrange and everything else. But we've got to make sure that we get the size of the cabinet right first, otherwise we'll be in trouble. So I think this can go a little bit narrower like that. Uh, these, the sizes of these are obviously going to end up being half the size of this. So what have we got? So middle to middle, about 30. So that's going to be about 15. That's pretty close already. If you don't have any blue tape, get some blue tape. It's just amazing stuff. All right. So we're going to get some rough measurements and then we're going to start marking out some timber. What I'm thinking is something along these lines here. I think we want something like What we're going to do is we're going to build this as a box. So like a top view there. And then we're going to use a magic trick, build a completely, completely sealed in box. And then we're going to cut the front off, which should give us the doors, which we're then going to cut again like that. It's a much easier way of making a unit that you need doors on. Now this is pretty cheap old stuff. It's not bad. This side is the B side and that side is the A side. What we're going to do is we're going to mark it out first. Now I'm going to cut this out on the table saw so I don't really need these lines, but I just want to illustrate how we can lay it out on the plywood. Do this first because otherwise you end up cutting these pieces out and then not having enough wood to finish the project, which is really irritating because then it means you have to go into the human land, which is being q or wherever you happen to get your cheap knockoff plywood. That's roughly where it is. Remember, we're not going to actually use these lines as a guide when we're cutting this out. We're just trying to figure out where the pieces are going to go. These table saws are pretty good, but you've got to calibrate all the measurements everywhere. Of this, the straightness of this, everything. Uh, so we're going to go two, 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 which I reckon is there. Probably need some blade. I've also got this, which is a zero clearance throat plate, which you'll see or hear about in various different videos. All that is, is to replace this one, which is the one that came with the saw, which has got a really big gap. By having no gap between the edge of the throat plate and the, the business bits of the blade. It means that when the blade spins this way and it's cutting through the fibers, there's something on this side to stop them being pulled down the middle, which means they're much less likely to chip out. Not impossible, but less likely. I reckon that's about right. Okay, now the whole world gets easier because we've cut down these huge pieces. I'm hoping that I can use my crosscut sled to hold this. 
Oh look, it's almost like I planned it. Amazing. Now, a cross-cut sled is probably one of the most useful things you can build for your table saw. I went over a little bit in the last video I did, I think, but if you can keep your hands away from the blade and make sure that you're pushing a, a, a perfectly aligned right angle to get things square, things are a lot easier. Now, the next thing is that I need now a piece that's exactly the same as this, and there's a trick for this. So we need, we need two pieces like this. Now we've got two choices. You can either measure it, or you can do this. Put it against the blade. Get a small piece of wood, like this one, and put it up against this side, and a clamp, and clamp it down. Then, you know that when you put this up against that stop, it's gonna be identical in size. You should have two pieces exactly the same width. So now we need to do the same on this piece. Now this isn't gonna be quite so easy because this isn't gonna be wide enough. When I make a new one of these, I'm going to make it much wider on the back. Probably in a funny V shape, maybe. I don't know. There we go. So let's talk joinery for a minute. A very exciting subject that we all love. There's lots of ways of joining two bits of wood together. Nails, screws, glue, uh, suction. Mm, maybe not suction. Anyway, we need something reasonably strong for this because it's a cabinet. It's going to have doors that are opening with all sorts of stresses on the corners and things. We need to be able to basically attach this to this. Okay, what we're going to do is do just normal dado joinery or rabbit joinery, depending on where you live in the world. Now, in the UK, we can't cut dados with a uh, dado stack because we're not allowed them in the UK because we're not clever enough and probably not safe enough either. So we have to do these in different ways. Now there's a number of different ways of doing this. You, you can do this with a table saw or you can do this with a router table or a router. Now I've got both but I realize that you may not so I'm going to show you both ways. So what we're aiming to achieve is something along this these lines here. We've got a recess in this piece of wood, which means this piece of wood can fit in it. It's very simple. That's all there is to it, really. The reason that this is strong is because you end up being able to stick long grain from this piece onto long grain from this piece. And when you stick long grain together, it's much, much stronger than sticking to end grain. Using some straws, I can show you very easily why some joints are gonna be stronger than other joints. So here we have some straws, ignore the bendy bits on the end. These are the fibers of the wood. They go in the direction that the tree grew or the branch grew. And most of the time these fibers run in a reasonably straight line going up and down. Now the strength of the tree relies on strength in compression because they're really heavy. I don't know if you've ever tried to pick one up, but they are. So if you push down on here, that actually hurts quite a lot. If you push down on here, they're really strong because they're all taking a part in supporting the pressure going onto the top. If you try and pick them apart, they're really, really easy to bend. If you can glue them together, so you have two pieces of wood, if you can glue them together and combine them, then they will strengthen each other in the bundle. The other thing that you have is surface area. If you're trying to stick two pieces of wood together like this, you're not going to get a very strong bond because you haven't got much surface area to stick things to. If you can stick them together like this, then you have all these this surface area here, down this side, as you can see there. So you end up extending the fibres. It makes a much, much stronger joint. So when you do a joint like this, you're combining the fibres going this way and you do get an end grain bond as well. This is a bit of plywood, so it's not 
is such a great example because you've got grain running in both directions on the plywood. Grain runs this way, grain runs that way, which is why it's useful to use because it's very stable. So yeah, so wherever possible, we really want to be able to stick fibers together going this way instead of just doing them on the end. Otherwise they're not going to work. So for the purposes of this build, we're going to make a rabbit down these sides here, something along those lines, like that. So how deep does it need to be into the receiving piece of wood? The receiving piece of wood in this case is going to be this bit. This is going to be the top or the bottom. And we need to know how deep to do it. I reckon probably half is this is good enough in this case. So what we can do is using the bottom of a vernier. If you haven't got one of these, you can use a tape measure. Use the bottom of the of the calipers. Set it roughly. It doesn't matter so long as they're all the same. That's the key thing here. Okay, and then we need to go and set up the table saw. We need to set up two settings on here. This is a lot easier if you've got a crosscut sled. If you don't have a crosscut sled, then you can try to use the slider that probably came with your table saw. You just have to attach a stop block, which is what we're going to do on here, onto here instead, and it should give you the same, um, well, this side probably, it will give you the same result. But it's a lot easier with one of these. So that's what I'm going to use because I have one. So the first thing we need to do is to set the depth of the blade. This is an easy task. Make sure your blade, make sure your table saw is switched off. They're really hard to get hold of if they're running. It's a nightmare. Make sure that the top tooth is pointing upwards. Now, that sounds a strange thing to say, but this is going to be our reference point. Then what you want to do is run the sword blade down and then bring it up so it just touches the bottom of the gauge and that should be about right. Just while we're measuring depth, there's a lot of different gauges available for depth. Here's another couple of two different types. I really like this one. They're really, really quick to use. They're very good for using them on or setting the depth on the um, round table. And I might actually do that in a minute, show you how this one works. It's quite simple. You set the depth like that, and then you're able to do the same thing by sticking it over the top and then rising it up and down so you can see where the blade touches the bottom of the gauge. Okay, so we set the depth. Now we need to set the width. Now we, we can do this by literally putting the piece of wood against the blade. I have chosen the tiniest piece of wood to do a stop block with, but there we go. So now, there's your marks. These are only rough, so you get an idea. I always find it's easier to draw the marks on the piece of wood so you get the rabbits in the right place. You don't want rabbits in the wrong place. It's terrible for your vegetables. Now you're not going to cut any further this way than the depth of the piece of wood you want to attach it to. And you have your depth set like that so you can see you don't have to worry about going too deep and then it's just a case of cutting it all out so there you can see a slightly rough dado cut down one side now we can probably clean this up with a chisel and get rid of any ridges that we might have left in it but you kind of see the idea Setting up the router table is very similar. You have two measurements to set, one going backwards and forwards here to set the, set the depth or set the width of the cut, and then you have the depth of the cut set as well. So let's set the depth of the cut. So you can see we've got the other depth gauge this time, and I've transferred the measurement from the calipers to this. So that's the depth set. Now we need the width setting. Setting the depth of these is a little more difficult because zero obviously is the center of the bit, which means we've already got, in this case, seven and a half millimeters sticking out the side because it's a 15 millimeter bit. So we want to cut out 12 millimeters. So that's another four and a half millimeters 
to go. So set this to four and a half. On that side, make sure it's the same on that side. Check it because if you're anything like me, you might not have had enough coffee yet for it to work properly. That looks right to me. And now we can make the cut. There we go. Perfecto. It's a lot quicker using a router table, as you can see, and it's a lot cleaner as well, but not everybody has one. So you have to make do with what you've got. We need to just clean up this edge. It's just a little ridge here. Get a nice sharp chisel. Remember, 80% of woodworking is sharpening. And then we should be able to just scrape that down a bit for a better finish. And there we go. Just a couple of little rough edges on the fibres. Take these off. Always clean up the work as you go. It just makes life much more pleasant. Plywood can be spiky, horrible, ratty old stuff. But if you smooth it down, Everything just becomes much nicer to handle. And we're supposed to be doing this because we enjoy it, right? There we go. Right, I'm going to go ahead and do all the other bits so you don't have to watch because I think you get the idea. And then we will start looking at gluing it up. Oh my God. The camera ran out of battery. I had no idea. So I've done part of the blow up already. But I haven't finished it, which is a good thing. So I can still so show you what we need to be doing. So I've still got this end and the top to do. I'm gonna put this end on first. Okay. When you're gluing up, no glue is too much really. Well, you don't wanna cover yourself in it, obviously, but you do wanna, you do wanna make sure you've got enough. You don't want wonky loose joints. We're gonna glue this up. Now, this glue pot is getting old. The no you can get new nozzles, I think. I must try and see if I can find one, because that's had it. Always paint the glue around. Do it with your finger if you lit, if you want. Better scrap a bit of wood. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways of doing this, but you're gonna have way too much glue. But we're gonna need it in there. So let's put it in there as well. I probably should have done just the three sides. But there you go, never mind. So this fits pretty snugly, actually. Move this to the bottom. Set the other way up. Make sure it's square on the corners. Now you can either clamp these, but I've got one of these. They're not that much money. It's a nail gun. It takes, what are they? 25 millimeter brad nails. It takes less than that, but I find that this is pretty much the best way to go. Ignore the ratty edges at the moment. We haven't done any cleanup on this yet. You'll be amazed on what a bit of creative sanding can do. And then secure the ends together first. Always keep your hands well out of the way of these things. These nails are so thin, they can literally fly in any direction they like. And it's quite often not the one that you want. And if your hand's in the way, they, they want your blood, basically. So when you do it, take your hand out of the way before you hit the button. See, that one blew through, because I went too far over to the edge. Let's do that again. Better. Once you've done the edges, Stitch it together. And just wipe down any excess. Doesn't matter really, you can scrape this off afterwards, it'll sand off. We're gonna sand the whole thing anyway, so there we go. So yeah, you can see here, I had a blowout. 
So we want to get rid of that. All the way around the top edge. Now this is going to be front. So we want the nice side frontwards. this in it's a bit tight this time we're not quite square but this will square it up a bit stick it down There we go, we have successfully made a small coffin for a dead thing. Now quite a lot of the time when you're doing this sort of thing, particularly for me, because I'm not as good as a lot of people, totally admit this, you end up with gaps and things like that around. There's a reasonably easy way to fix all this. So this is going to be our front. And I thought I'd do this before we cut it in half because I think it'll make it a bit easier. There's gaps all over the place. So what we really need is some nice wood filler. The problem is, is that wood filler, you're probably even going to get the colour match. And I mean, this doesn't really matter because it's a piece of shop furniture, but let's just do it anyway. Because making shop furniture is where you hone your skills for anything else you might want to make that's actually supposed to be of any kind of quality. And sometimes these things are better. So I've got some sawdust fresh off the table saw because the dust collection on the table saw is rubbish and you can make wood filler so long as you have sawdust and glue and this is just as easy as this really squidge out some glue and get some of the sawdust fine sawdust is probably best and dump it on and just make a paste probably a bit too much sawdust in that you want it to be reasonably loose and then just find the gaps you want to fill Gorge it in them. And it's going to look a real mess for a while. You can also do this if you get big voids in the plywood, which we generally do get in the UK because it's incredibly hard for us to find decent plywood in the UK unless we're prepared to spend, well, anything up to about a hundred pounds a sheet I've seen a sheet being a four by eight sheet I might just do this with my fingers why am I doing like that here we go that's better the best tools that we were ever given depending on your point of view see there's a void in there we can get rid of that now you don't have to let this dry before you start sanding, fortunately. So now for the magic. I've got an orbital sander here. You can probably use any kind of sander, but this is the one I use. Now orbital sanders have these discs and they have the holes around there. Now the holes are normally going to suck the dust up into this bag and keep everything a bit cleaner. Now if you're doing this kind of thing while you're trying to fill up voids with glue in them, a tip is to put the disc offset from the holes. Now this obviously makes more dust, you have to compensate for that, hence the mask there, the respirator, but 
it means that instead of sucking the dust into the bag, it'll push the dust into the cracks, into the holes. So if you've got glue there, you basically are making paste as you go. Now, it does wreck your disc quite quickly. This is a bit of an old one anyway, um, but it'll do the job as you'll see. So now we've done that bit, we need to decide how big things are gonna be. I think that's gonna be the front. So initially I said we were gonna have a straight in half slice, but I think I'm gonna change that and I'm gonna go for 70 millimeters. Right, to the table saw. We need to set the fence at 70 mil. I'm going to put a little bit of wood in there to stop the thing collapsing across the kerf cut. We'll see whether that works or not. Let's do the back. There you go see what happens. Whoop. That's why you tape the thing up when you cut it. And there you have quite a gluey box cabinet and door, which we need to cut down the middle, yeah. So we need to find the middle of this. Two ways of doing this. Tape measure, that is 29 centimeters, so 14.5 take away one and a half is 14.35, 14.35. All the other way of doing it is to get a pair of dividers, compasses, whatever you want to call them. Guess where the middle is. Turn them around, not quite right. Slightly too small. Yeah, perfect. Now you can use these. Put the point on the middle of the blade. And huh, there you go, 14.35. My table saw must be reasonably accurate. Now we need a bit of depth on the blade. Incidentally, you may be wondering why this is in use. A lot of people buy these very expensive pushers. This is a, a, a sanding block, which I bought for B&Q for I think £1.50. And it's got a foam bottom which means it grips everything brilliantly well. And I've got two, I don't know where the other one is, but it's a very, very useful alternative if you need a wide block to push with. Now we have the two halves of our doors and the cabinet. It's starting to come together. And look how amazingly well they fit because they were the same thing. And that's the trick. All we need now is to clean up the insides, hinges, and then make the rails that we're gonna have on here to hold things in. One of the things I'm not gonna do on this channel is to pretend that I never make any mistakes. I see so many videos where you see what looks like an absolute perfect build. But let me tell you, it never happens. So 
I'm all up for just showing you that we all make mistakes and actually the tricks in, co in covering up the mistakes are really the business end of most of these things. It doesn't matter whether what, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You're always going to make mistakes. So for hinges, I thought I'd use these things. They're big, long, long ones. And I've cut them down to the right length. So hopefully they'll fit nicely on there. I'm going to put these back together. I've put a little bit of spacer in here because obviously we cut a bit of wood out just so I can get it straight. Put a spacer in the top to make life a bit easier. So there we go. We have a cupboard with an opening doors, with some offset opening doors. I've explained French cleats before, but if you can't remember, they're just 245 degree pieces of wood that fit together like that, and one grabs hold of the other, and off you go. Um, so we need to cut some French cleats. Now the depth of the piece of wood that you use will determine obviously how much surface area there is in here to be able to grab. These are not going to hold masses of weight, but a whole rack of drill bits is probably quite heavy, especially if we did one all the way across the back. So I'm going to use some 18 millimeter plywood of the same type to make the cleats. And I'll show you how to do it. We need to set the angle of the blade. Now the important thing when you're cutting a French cleat is to remember that you've still got to have a piece left over to screw into. You need to remember to leave enough gap on the other side. I normally leave about 30 millimetres over this side. And then I'll back the blade back down again because we know it's set at the right angle now to keep all my fingers intact. And then it's just a case of making the cut. And there we have two halves. Now I'm probably going to make cut a few of these out so that uh, I can just line the back. We need to figure out where we're going to put all these cleats. Now I want these level. It would be really annoying to go to all this trouble and then have them not level. That's going to be a pain to do that bottom one. Let's do this one first. So glue the, glue the back. These brushes I got off of Amazon, I think they were like five quid for 48 of them they're called acid brushes i'm not really sure why maybe if you know let me know in the comments i have no idea now don't do what i did the first time i did this which was glue the back onto there on glue the bottom cleat on and then put the thing on it that i was trying to put on it like that and then the glue which squeezed out glued this piece to the cleat you live and learn don't you so we're going to put this in and we're going to just tack it on we square it because i moved it nailer the jack nailer 
any people in the UK are going to understand that joke. And even then, maybe not everybody. So, uh, we can use the square as a guide and distance. Look, that's nice and OCD, isn't it? Quite therapeutic doing the glue. If I'm trying to get my kids off of Fortnite or whatever else it is that they're playing at the time, my little girl who's coming up eight loves to help glue. It's a good thing to do with your kids. Try and get them out onto the workshop. It can make life challenging if you get them out of the workshop, but it doesn't half help. Give a good impression to them and get them to realize that actually making stuff is not that hard. Making stuff that looks beautiful is hard. I'm not particularly good at that, but I can get by. And getting by is all we really have to do at the moment. Right. Now on to the doors. We're getting nearly at the end, and I'm really pleased that you stuck with me, because these things take a long time to do. <laughs> it takes a while to do something properly, and I'd like to know whether you like seeing the bits where we work out the problem, or whether they're just not something that you want to see, because I need to know. I'm going to go ahead and do all the rest. Right, there we go. I know some of them don't match, but I will paint this at some point. Right, now we have one more to do, which has got to go on the back, because we're going to have to attach it. So, so I did cut one extra, it's gone on the back. Make sure you get them the right way up. The amount of times I've done it like this, or like that, or like that, it's just incredible. So do them right way up. So. Ah, look at that. Perfect. We'll square it up in a minute. Don't skimp on the glue. Not on this bit. It's going to hold all the weight. If you're doing something like a wall-mounted cupboard that is a, that is a nice thing. A good tip is to make these so they're obviously inset from the side so then you can hide the cleat with a strip going down the side which would look a lot nicer than this. There we go. Now the other thing that you need to do is if this hangs on the wall it's going to be sitting out slightly so you need a piece on the bottom that's going to bridge the gap at the bottom. got one of those silicone spatulas that you get in the kitchen they're amazing for glue spreading because you can put the glue on you don't even need to clean the spatula and then because they're made of silicone they bend you can then just wait for it to dry and then peel it off which is enormously satisfying again I'm not quite sure why so okay. but you might as well do it properly everything you do Everything you do is practice for the time that you do have to do it properly. Happy days. There we go. You can see I was impatient. I wanted to try it now, so I put some tape up inside the cleat just to make sure that I don't stick it to the wall. So, let's go. There we are. I'm quite pleased. I went and cut these up. These are the original holders for my the bits. I cut them up off camera because I thought that would be quite boring to watch. Might want to put more layers in here. But this is the cool thing about this is that you can rearrange these things to do anything you like and however best things fit. Now these might not be the things I use for the final go but you know they work pretty well. Now I thought about going through making these but to be honest, I think the video is probably long enough already. And the process is exactly the same as what we've just done. You can see, look, so you've got a recessed rabbit in there. If you remember what we did at the beginning, um, 
not much creative sanding needed on these, but you know, if you need to, you need to. French cleat halves, drill the holes however you want to drill them, and then fill it up. There you go. I've got a lot more sorting out to do. I need to make a lot more of these inserts. But the thing to remember is that if I decide I don't want this to be a drill bit cabinet anymore, I can make it anything I like. You can make it something for your kids. Uh, craft supplies, you can make it for anything you want. These things are just holders to put in whatever you want. You can make any, any holder you like to hold anything you like. That's about it for this time. Thank you ever so much for watching. Please leave a comment as to what you thought. And if you make one, let me know how it went. Did you get the same sorts of sticky problems that I did? Which bits were harder than others? Every build is different. It'll go really well one time and it'll go really horribly another time. Sometimes you may have to just throw it away and start again. But the thing is, the only failure is giving up. That's it. Keep going, carry on, make something in your workshop. This is good for the soul. Please like, subscribe, hit the bell. There's going to be a lot more of this coming. Some more storage ideas, hopefully, and some more workshop chat. So that's all for now. Thank you. Bye.